Hey guys, and welcome back to History Revision Success. So today I'm going to go through um, an A-level video, which should hopefully be really helpful at cementing some contextual understanding of kind of the legacy of the foreign policy that Elizabeth I inherited. Now, I think this will probably form one part of a couple of videos because there's actually a lot to get through. It's quite a dense topic. So in particular, we're focusing on context and legacy and really why Elizabeth was so vulnerable by the point of inheriting the throne, why she was in a very unique position compared to her um, father, her grandfather, her, her brother and sister, um, that meant she had to make some quite tactful choices when it came to her foreign policy. So first of all, what were her aims? What did she actually want to achieve with this foreign policy? And overall, she absolutely wanted a peaceful foreign policy. She wanted to avoid costly wars. She had seen what had happened under Mary, the loss of Calais, the war she inherits that she has to end at the very beginning of her reign, um, and equally under her brother Edward, the financial burden of the war in Scotland, which really kind of led to the mid Tudor crisis, particularly financially. Um, and she definitely wanted to avoid that. So we can say she wanted to emulate her grandfather, Henry VII. In addition, she actually has more of a need to avoid war. She is a lone female queen where being a woman is um, regarded as a significant weakness. She doesn't have a husband who can guide her or support her um, militarily in that way. So she will be perceived to be a weak monarch, whether that's the case or not is an entirely different issue. Um, what she does manage to do, however, is she uses that weakness to become actually one of her greatest strengths. And she uses the idea of um, kind of flirtation and wooing and the option of marriage, the option of proposal um, to get people on her side. She uses it as a foreign policy tool um, of creating alliances. And in a later video, maybe I'll talk about that because it's not really so much to do with the context. But anyway, she has a stronger need to avoid war because she is a woman, because she is Protestant. If we just have a look at the map, um, these are the countries which are of significant importance to Elizabeth at this point in time. So we've got Scotland, we've got Ireland, Burgundy, I'll get to that in a second, um, which has now become the Netherlands, Spain, who control both the Netherlands and Portugal, and France. Now it all gets extremely complicated because Scotland is a Protestant country led by the Lords of Congregation. However, they see the return of their Catholic Queen, Mary Queen of Scots. Ireland is governed by um, Elizabeth. However, the Irish people themselves are predominantly Catholic. So they are a Catholic country under a Protestant Queen. The Netherlands predominantly are Protestant. We have conflict between Catholic Spain and the Netherlands. And France is undergoing um, internal disputes, civil war between the Catholics and the Protestants. So across Europe, there are some significant international issues and um, issues of instability in all of these main countries that Elizabeth has to contend with. I guess the one thing to notice is the fact that pretty much every or all of these powerful countries apart from Scotland are strongly Catholic. So that also puts her in a vulnerable position um, internationally because she becomes a target. And especially from 1570 with the papal bull of excommunication, she is absolutely highlighted as a target by the Pope to be removed because of her Protestant faith. So I'm gonna go through the first reason in this video and that's because of something that happens in Burgundy. And to understand it, you have to understand the history and legacy of Burgundy as a place. So this will help with revision as well under Henry VII and Henry VIII. So Burgundy originally at the start of the Tudor period was difficult and we'll get to why in a second, but 
it becomes by the end of Henry VII's rule, a very useful ally and trading partner. They particularly aid um, England against France and it's very good with trade. Therefore, the reason she is vulnerable is because by the point of Elizabeth's reign, Burgundy doesn't even exist anymore. And secondly, it's controlled by Philip of Spain. So she has lost Burgundy as an ally to aid her in, in the international field. Now, the reason for that is this. Charles the Bold is the first person who kind of we care about really that comes into Burgundy and takes it over. Now, he marries his third wife, Margaret of York. If you're thinking in your head, mm, that's because, yes, she's the sister of Edward, King of England, the Yorkist king. OK, now, because of that, by Henry Tudor's reign, um, we have serious tension, serious problems. She's a Yorkist sister. She's obviously not particularly um, happy with the fact that Henry VII is now on the throne. She supports the pretenders, Perkin Warbeck, for example, and she's therefore a problem. Now, after her support of Perkin Warbeck, um, Henry VII issues a trade embargo against Burgundy, and England and Burgundy at this point are very much at um, lockerheads. They are not getting on at all well. Now, Charles the Bold had a previous daughter, Mary, from one of his earlier marriages. And Mary marries Maximilian of Habsburg, um, the first Habsburg king to have influence in Burgundy. So he's going to become the Holy Roman Emperor. Now they have a son, Philip, who is Duke of Burgundy. And it's at this point that actually Henry VII starts to create a relationship um, with Philip. And first of all, they sign the Intercursus Magnus, which shows a development of more of an amicable relationship between England and Burgundy. They start to support each other um, at quite favorable terms for England in this treaty. Um, Philip goes on to marry Joanna of Castile, who is the older sister of Catherine of Aragon, Henry VIII's and Arthur's wife. Now, trading terms between England and Burgundy get even better when Joanna and Philip are caught in a shipwreck just off the coast of England and um, Henry VII kind of holds them captive until Philip agrees to sign the Malice into Curses in 1506, which gives England even more favourable terms. Um, and it also means that the Burgundy has to hand over Edmund de la Pole. So at this point, we might say they have a much better relationship than prior. Um, Margaret of Burgundy has far less influence over what's going on in Burgundy's kind of foreign affairs. And they start acting as an ally and as a trading partner to England. Now, what happens over the next kind of couple of generations is why Burgundy is lost to Elizabeth as such. So Philip and Joanna have a son, Charles, who inherits the Holy Roman Empire from his grandfather, Maximilian. Now, Charles is not only the daughter of um, the Duke of Burgundy and Joanna of Castile, who is the oldest child of Ferdinand of Spain. Um, he's also the nephew of Catherine of Aragon. So he inherits Spain through his mother, Burgundy through his father, the Holy Roman Empire through his grandfather, and the Netherlands come with that. Now, he's also, as I said, the nephew of Catherine. So if you're trying to timeline and contextualize this, he is the person who captures the Pope during the um, situation where Henry is asking for his divorce. So that's why the Pope refuses to grant the divorce. So from kind of 1525, which is where we'd say is the beginning of the great matter, Henry's great matter, the issue of the divorce, obviously we start to see a breakdown in relations between England and Burgundy. Now it gets even worse um, because Charles V is, you know, this incredibly powerful man in Europe, probably one of the most powerful men we have in Europe in terms of his territory and what he controls. And he decides actually it's not the best way to rule. And so on his death, his empire is divided between his brother, Ferdinand, who becomes Ferdinand I of the Holy Roman Empire, and who kind of takes the Austrian and Germanic territories, and his son, 
Philip II of Spain, who is given Spain and the Netherlands. Now, at this point, Burgundy is also kind of, it just no longer really exists. It's, it's enveloped into the Netherlands, into Philip's territory. So this is why by Elizabeth's reign, she can no longer rely on Burgundy as an ally against some of the significant powers in Europe. Um, Burgundy is controlled by Philip, who she is at odds with, um, and we'll explain why in a later video on foreign policy to talk about the Armada, et cetera, the breakdown of that relationship. Um, and even more so, Burgundy just doesn't exist anymore to be an ally in that situation. Hopefully this was helpful. This is something that I found very confusing until I kind of mapped it all out and could see on paper how we go from Burgundy under Margaret of York, Margaret of Burgundy under Henry VII, and all the way through to where Burgundy goes, why they can't help Elizabeth as an ally anymore, and how Philip of Spain actually comes to be such a powerful person in Europe, um, and connecting those dots with, with Catherine of Aragon and with, with, the, with the Spanish rulers as well. Hopefully that was helpful. Please do like the video, leave a comment, tell me what you want to see more of. Um, if this video gets lots of likes, um, I will continue making this series and I will make the video to follow, focusing on the context of kind of France, Ireland, um, Scotland, and then we can do some videos on actual foreign policy under Elizabeth, the role of Spain, what happens with Spain, what happens in the Netherlands, what happens with France, um, you know, and, and all that good stuff. So see you next time, guys.